Good morning and welcome to Office Blog 04. And today I'm pretty excited because, well, for one, there are bookshelves right here, which have been so hard to find. <laughs> um, so we have one, two, three bookshelves, and these are identical. Now, I was initially going to use them here to put the PC games on, but I'm thinking about changing my mind uh, for something I will show you in a moment. Uh, but we have two objectives. One is to set these up, and the other has to do with this, because today we're bringing in all of my test equipment. And unfortunately, I don't have my electronics workbench set up yet, so I can't exactly put it all in place where it's going to go finally. But uh, I do want to test some of it here because I have new power supplies and I'm pretty excited about that and I haven't really had a chance to try and use them yet. So today I want to connect them to this because they're HP and HPIB. So I want to at least try setting one up with that and my HP 34401A multimeter and do a voltage set and measurement back just to have a little fun with it. But first off, I need to go bring some stuff in and a lot of it's pretty much just actually all of it is really heavy test equipment. Uh, there are some things that are going to go on these bookshelves uh, that are in there that I will be bringing in as well, but we'll get to those after the test gear. Okay, I've uh, got everything in. There's some stuff for the bookshelves right there, and then actually this bin uh, is all of my HP Series 80 stuff and a couple other things we'll get to as this video goes on. Um, I'm actually thinking first, though, I want to try arranging these bookshelves uh, from the front of the window here and then see if I can fit all three along this wall. It's really, really tight. I don't think I can, but I want to see if I can, or at least how much it'll encroach on that doorway and such, but uh, it would be really nice if I could do that. There is enough space that I could put one along the window if I want, but I'm looking at that because the Eckhorn's chair was right in that corner, and uh, yeah, I need this space to have bookshelves as well as we will get to um, but it's really crowded right now now some other things i brought in over here we have one orphan bin that is more uh components those are motherboards those are okay parts there's a bunch of stuff in there we'll get to some of what's there in a moment that i brought in here oh this is something that I thought I had brought last time, and that is my bin of Atari stuff, finally. Um, figured out where that went, so now I have those here. Um, that does not contain the ST. That's somewhere else that I need to locate still after the move. Probably ended up in a box, so it's not what I was really hoping for, but, you know, I wasn't hoping to move. Uh, but here is where this gets really interesting. Now, I realize I haven't actually told you what the HP 85 is. This is a computer, uh, but it's essentially a science and engineering computer. Uh, this thing is really, really excellent. It has a tape drive that I'm probably never going to use. Um, I've actually already got myself onto the waiting list for the everything but the kitchen sink board to put into that that will emulate the tape drive so I can store data on it. But this is a science and engineering computer like the HP 86 that I did a video on a long time ago, and it takes cards in the back that can interface with the test equipment I bought. So let's take a look at that. So first off down here is the HP 16500C that I've already done a video on. So that, uh, you can go and check that out. Now, these are where it gets really interesting because I finally have some HPIB power supplies. So we have three new ones here. These two are 100 watt, um, what is this one? This one's 20, 0 to 20 volts and 5 amps, and this one is 0 to 50 volts at 2 amps. So these are a 6632A and a 6633A. So those are single output, 100-watt uh, power supplies, HPIB, GPIB controllable, and I am really, really excited to have those because the only power supply I've had so far is this BK Precision 1711, and it is fully analog to the point where I even put a... Uh, like a RC battery display on it, so they can easily confirm what the voltage is because the dials are just mostly accurate. They're okay, they're not amazing. Now, another thing I grabbed here 
was this beast. I think it's a 6624A. Yeah, this is a quad output power supply. Now the outputs are weaker. Uh, I think the strongest rail on here is two amps, but four outputs and uh, again, all programmable. So that one's really sweet. It is a monster. It is so heavy. Those are way lighter than I thought they would be and much smaller. Uh, today we're going to use the 32A because it has outputs on the front and that makes it easier. And we're going to pair it with my 34401A, which is down in there just to make it easier to move. Um, down here, this is not GPIB controllable, but it is really cool. This is a liter NTSC pattern generator. Um, and this outputs video in composite, actually. Um, and it's pretty sweet. Uh, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to use it yet because I got it right as I was moving. Um, it was a, a whole thing. Uh, we're actually going to see one of the things that I got uh, with this today. Well, I also got a blonder tongue. It's down there. And the new Extron. That's the VGA Extron. I can grab that really quick. Yeah, so this one's way lighter than the other one. Um, but we can see this has actual VGA ports and LAN. So it's a lot easier to interface with. As ours 232 as well, but why would you want that when you can have LAN? So that is the test gear. Uh, test bench, not here yet. Uh, I can't put it in yet either because buried way deep into my storage unit is the cabinet <laughs> for it. So I have to extract that before I can even consider bringing the bench in. I have all the other parts, but it'll just be like lopsided sitting on the ground if I try and bring it in right now. So that won't work. But first, because this is really crowded in here now with these and then the chair in the wrong location, uh, I'm going to see if I can position these how I would like. So let's see that first. It's occurring to me that these are pretty weak and that I need to restaple the backs. So I guess I'm going to be flipping them around here, but that confirms that this will work. Uh, that is a lot more space than I thought I had to work with these. That's really nice. Um, I'm excited. Okay. Um, so the bookshelves here, these are three really identical bookshelves, which I'm very happy about. However, there are some things that I don't like about them. Uh, one are these because I want to be able to use the complete space that's in there. And well, these just kind of kill off some of that. So it's useless. Uh, I did confirm that there are, uh, little hidden plastic things in here that are blocking out access to some screws. Oh man, that's a long screw. Uh, yeah. And that'll free that. So I got to pull these off. I'm happy to lose that. Oh yeah. That's way better. I like that. These look like they came with it. Um, all of these had like a bunch of weird cabinetry on them. I had to take it off of these two to get them in my van to bring them home. Yeah, this is not like a desk. This is not load bearing. It could not hold anything, but still, ugh. Also, you may notice I'm recording with my uh, black magic again here. The server seems to be sorted out so I can kind of process this footage, or at least the server has, there's a plan here. Why does this feel like it's on a rail? Oh, cause it's on a rail. That's, oh, okay, this is all weird. I gotta get these plastic things out of here. Um, the server has a bad E52690. Uh, I'm going to be sent one by the person who sent me the motherboard in the first place, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Uh, so I should be able to fix the server sometime soon. But in the meantime, it turns out that it was actually one of the memory controllers on the E52690 that's bad. So I pulled out enough RAM to avoid the slot that's bad with it. And that, oh man, uh, that gave it, that made it work because it was having issues where uh, there were actually IPMI uh, ECC issues. Um, it said they were correctable, but then it would hang. So I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but uh, I got it working. My gosh, this is, this does not want to cooperate. Oh, spying random ancient bookshelves has taught me anything. It's that I hate stupid cabinet fasteners. 
I did something weird actually as I continue on to this. I actually bought modern headphones, wireless Galaxy Earbuds Plus. It's uh, it's quite a departure for me. Uh, I had a few objectives. I wanted to be able to put well, just one in and then be able to listen to music or something without being uh, completely oblivious to my surroundings. And then I was hoping that I could record my phone vlogs with this as a microphone, but that doesn't work um, as far as I can tell. I even have a Samsung phone, it's a Note 9. But no, they don't want to get along, which is really frustrating. But uh, now I can listen to music while I'm doing these kinds of very long shots and it's not obtrusive. I don't normally like to listen to Bluetooth audio over a phone, but this is uh, the most practical thing for this kind of use. Okay, uh, I think that is it. So now I just need to uh, flip them around. Well, I need to figure out where I want the shelves first. Um, then I need to flip them around and I can uh, tack in the backs so that I know that they won't slide down. Like you can see this one actually a little here, it's sliding down on the side. Uh, you know what I could do? I could just spin them around and then uh, tack it. They're in rails. Could just tack the rail so it can't fall. I don't need it attached to the back. I'm doing that. So this one isn't falling down. Uh, I can see that it's tacked into this bottom shelf that's fixed. Ah, well, I can easily do that. That'll work. There we go. Okay. <laughs> These will work. Uh, this is annoying. I'm not sure what's leaning where. Uh, maybe these will come over as that happens, but I might end up putting a little brace along the top of these to keep them aligned. But eh, I'll find out as I do stuff. Okay. Are you ready to find out? Not the secret stuff yet uh, that's going on here. But one of the reasons that I want bookshelves out here that are not going to have PC games. Now, you can probably guess one of the things that I'm really excited to be able to put in here because it's all of the manuals and documentation I have for the many vintage computers that I own, like the TI-99 4A there, but also other stuff like I have the manuals for my uh, 3441A multimeter. Those will go up there, probably not on the same shelf as the computer stuff, but I have actually kind of a lot of this stuff. Um, and I used to have places for it all to go, but that didn't last very long. So I'm happy that I'm going to be able to have enough space here that I can dedicate some to just manuals. So this is definitely one aspect that I'm really excited about. But I have some stuff that's even cooler. As I've become more serious about making videos, one of the things that I've come to appreciate more or historical references for things. And one of the things that I keep coming back to for true references to these devices that I look at now in the year 2021 are the magazines and reviews of them when they were new. So getting some vintage magazines is a really handy way to be able to do that. And uh, well, I've got some interesting stuff now. now I mentioned when I was picking up this NTSC pattern generator, that there was something else that I grabbed and I just showed you part of it. This is a nearly complete set of popular electronics from the late 1980s all the way through until I believe 1998. And there is a brief stint in here that is missing when it changed over from her uh, to hands-on electronics that is missing because that wasn't a direct continuation. But this is, as far as I'm aware, 
complete and contains a lot of awesome historic examples of computer items and just technology in general, especially test gear, um, because that was what their primary focus was on, uh, and raw electronics. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in here, and this shelf is going to get all of it. Now, these actually came in these cardboard dividers, but I don't think I want to use them, but for right now, I'm gonna use them to put them on the shelves because they have the dates already kind of written on them and that'll make my life a lot easier. So that actually is uh, 1960s, 65. This is where the lineage here starts in this collection in 1974 and continues on for a few years. And I'm just gonna fill this up. It's gonna go to about here. So it's only gonna be about half the shelf, but that's still really awesome. Uh, I do need to put the other uh, shelves in here though. So let me do that right now. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and move all of these into here. There we go. This is a little bit, uh, 1962 and 65, um, but then from 1974, June, all the way to 1999, actually December 99, so basically the year 2000, um, is every single issue of uh, Popular Electronics, and that's funny, because I actually pulled out two issues here. The first one was Electronics World, and then Popular Electronics, actually, no, three. Um, this one was Computers and Electronics, uh, one of these that I pulled out. So this is one of the things that's interesting about Popular Electronics that I noticed as I looked through these. Um, so there was apparently a bit of a torrid history with this magazine, because at this point in the production of it, it was almost exclusively about electronics. Popular Electronics is an offshoot of Radio Electronics, and this was meant to be more specific to electronics as discrete components as opposed to analog devices. So you would get things like TTL Logic in here. Then it started to evolve, especially in the late 70s, you would start to see things about computers and different electronics that were more dedicated purpose and not just general electronics. Then as the computers really started to come out and become popular, <laughs> it was becoming increasingly uh, not about just actual, uh, like look, there was an HP calculator, it wasn't about raw electronics as components, it was becoming much more consumer oriented. And I think that the users didn't really appreciate that, at least after a while, because what really happened here is that they just went all in on electronic or computers. So it became computers and electronics, formerly popular electronics. And these all focused heavily on computers and computer related things. And this is the era where I'm most interested in because this is gonna cover everything that I usually do videos and talk about. So that era is really nice. But in 1984, yeah, 1984, computers and electronics was basically discontinued. That period is known as hands-on electronics after that. It wasn't a direct continuation of this magazine. It was kind of a different thing that just happened in its place. Then, we get back to popular electronics here. And we can see this first one here, hands-on electronics combined with popular electronics as an introduction. And then it goes back to hands-on electronics and barely mentioning hands-on electronics. From here, it goes much more back to its roots. We can see we have a hobby box here and it continues on like that starting in 1989. It manages to stay this way, being mostly focused on electronics and avoiding computers. Um, there are some brief sections that I've noticed in some of these where they'll review software, um, but I think for the most part they try and stay away from computers as much as possible because they probably angered their audience a bit with it. So it's kind of interesting to go back and see that. Probably during this time, there was a lot of overload of information on computers and the people who were really interested in electronics were frustrated that their hobby became the computer industry and then it left them without their magazine that allowed them to talk about it. So in the end, popular electronics 
ultimately went the way of everything. Um, it briefly renamed to Poptronics and yeah, you can see it's back to computers. <laughs> well, this isn't really about computers. This is about a particular computer that is designed for electronics components and different things. But after this, they started doing online publications. This is not the last issue of Poptronics, but this is where my collection ends. Um, and I believe it was 2003 that Poptronics eventually ended and went fully online and then just kind of went away. So there was a history here in these magazines and I'm really happy to have them and to be able to look at that and see that in person. But to me, the value here is really in it as a library for going back and finding things. And I'm really excited about that. Now, this happened as I was moving and it piqued my interest in magazines and having a library like this. And it turned me on to something else that I could potentially get my hands on and I ended up being able to. And it's even more exciting than this, but it's gonna get its own video. But let's just say this shelf's gonna be full. Okay, so now I think you can understand why I have been trying to get bookshelves so badly uh, because I have some pretty cool stuff coming up. Now I want to take a look at the test gear that I got and we're gonna use the HP 85 to do that. So first off, this is a power supply. I'm just gonna turn on here, it's a little loud. And uh, the way that this works is I'm going to set a V set here and let's say I want to set the voltage to 15. I'm gonna type that in, hit enter. We can now see 14.997 volts. So this uses a feedback system where it sets a voltage and then adjusts it based on the measured voltage that it actually gets. Um, so this is like half DMM, half power supply and it self regulates. So it's kind of cool, but that's part of why it's a little off because it's like a PID feedback loop. Uh, but then I would also have to do an I set so I could do say one amp. Uh, oh. Uh, but it's not drawing anything, so it can't do that yet. Uh, but that would be power configured on this. Now, the cool thing about this device and this device is that these come from the same era when Hewlett Packard was all over HPIB. This is their interface for connecting devices like this to things like this. Now, this is a card that I've talked about in the video that I heavily featured it in. Uh, when I did e-video uh, data logging, like it's 1982 with my HP 86. And I highly recommend you watch that because I'm not gonna go into this in a tremendous amount of detail here. Uh, but I am gonna show you that this is the cable and it plugs into the back of this unit. And then we can turn both of these on. This shows up, now when it turns on, you may have seen the address. I can actually bring up the address here and you can see that it's set to two. Well, we're gonna leave it as two. And on here, now that this is started up, I'm going to do output 802. Now the GPEB card is device eight and it's using the hunter's place here to denote that. And then two is the address of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to send a command here we're gonna do V set and let's just set it back to 15. Now that that has been power cycled, it doesn't have uh, that voltage set anymore. And we can see the voltage here is currently zero. If I hit enter, it is now 15. This thing just set the voltage on this thing. Now that cable that's going to the back of that, it can only be connected to that thing and then that's it. But that's not quite the end of this. So that's the HP 85 connected to the HP 6632A. However, I also have my 34401A here, which is a true multimeter. Now I could move the HPIV connector that is plugged in right here to there and then control the multimeter instead of the power supply. But you don't have to do that with HPIB or GPIB. And this is one of the things that I'm pretty darn excited about because I got myself a lot of GPIB cables. Now, this was very expensive. This was a $180 box. Oh God, of cables. Um, you know, hey, buy a shirt. <laughs> 
that would that would really help. Uh, they're nice. I like them. Uh, the print quality is really good on these new designs. You know, but yeah, one hundred eighty dollars. So please buy a shirt. Uh, but <laughs> with these, I now have everything I need to connect a multitude of HPIB devices at once. The thirty four four zero one A has just been my first device, and then I had the sixteen five hundred C there. But I've never been able to connect both of them at once until now. So what I'm going to do right here, right now, is I'm going to piggyback the connector on the uh, power supply here. And then, I haven't tested this yet either, so if this doesn't work, uh, well, that's a possibility. Uh, then I'm going to plug the other end here to the multimeter. Now. This is device address two. This is device address seven. So once I plug power into the multimeter, we should be able to control both of them at once. Okay, this is plugged in. It has power. I have not even power cycled this. I'm pretty sure GPIB is effectively hot swappable, but let's try controlling this now. So I can do the same command here. I'm actually gonna go ahead and go back up and we're going to change the voltage let's say to 10 uh, just to confirm that that's still working so v set 10 boom 10 excellent uh now let's set this uh to uh well i wanted to do a measurement let's do let's just do a measurement okay so what that'll do is that will change the display to a static value and it will just be zero so you can see right now it's cycling through because it's doing live measurements uh, we're going to go ahead and take a single measurement. So I'm going to do output 807 because when this starts up, I can also just uh, check it here real quick. I can go to the I.O. menu and I can see the HPIB address is 7 on this device. So I know that's what it is. So we can go ahead and turn the menu off here and let's do measure. We're going to request a read back, but it should do this all at once. There we go. So we just took a measurement from this multimeter after setting a voltage on this all from the one device. We have essentially a network of devices here controllable from the HP 85. This is so cool. So I've wanted to do this for a very long time, try and set this kind of thing up, and I've just not had the ability to, uh, partially because I didn't have the power supplies. I'm really happy to have the power supplies, but I've had the 34401A and the HP 16500C, and just haven't been able to do this. But now I can, and I'm gonna have the space to do it once I can get my electronics bench in here. But man, am I excited to be able to take a look at this in more detail and set up everything all at once. That box, that was 17 GPIB cables, so I can connect absolutely everything that I have uh, more so than that because if I go and try and do adjust the address here um, which is a little easy oh you can't do that when it's in remote mode interesting so let's restart this now I believe GPIB has an address limit for standard GPIB of uh, seven devices so let's try setting this to address 10 did it just take that it's address 10 okay now I'm curious here can this do address 10? Is it 16 devices? Is that the limit? Uh, so one, zero. It took it. Okay, I did not realize that. That's even better. <laughs> so uh, I thought I was going to be close to the limit because I'm going to have the 34401A, 16500C, the 6632A, the 6633A, and then the 6624A and then a computer, which would give me only one device free if it was the seven devices, but apparently not. So, okay. All right, so I'm pretty much gonna call it here because those were about the two main objectives that I wanted to do today. We've verified that the GPIB cables I bought work and that this setup will work, and I'm really excited about that since I now have so many devices that can be hooked up that way. Oh man, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and then, of course, I finally have achieved bookshelves, and I'm starting to set up all the stuff that's going to make these really awesome. Now, I am still going to be on the hunt for more bookshelves for the PC game stuff. Oh, I didn't talk about this. So, okay, the HP 85, that's one thing that can control the test equipment. 
but that's not what I want to use. Um, I will do a video with that because that's what it's uh, made to be used with. But this is a pretty interesting thing here. This is an SBC card. Uh, so this actually has a Pentium 4, actually. It has the big brother to the one that's in the uh, XP computer that I built. This has a 3.8 gigahertz hyper-threading Pentium 4 on an LGA 775 socket. But that card can be slotted into this backplane board, which has ISA slots. And because that has ISA slots, that means that I can go over here to my interface card store and I can pull out, here it is. Yes, I'm excited. That is an ISA GPIB card. And that will work in the backplane with that Pentium 4. So I'm going to be building a PC that can interface with the HPIB devices. And I'm really looking forward to that. Now, I've asked about this on Twitter and it should be possible for me to compile a version of Linux that'll work on the 32-bit processor because 64-bit stuff is what everything is now. But it should be possible to get a modern version of something like Debian or Slackware going Probably going to try Slackware, even though I've never used that before, because I've been advised that that will work well with the Linux GPIB driver that I know will work with this NI uh, AT GPIB card. So I'm looking forward to that. That is on their list of supported devices. I also have two other GPIB cards, so I brought one out here. Um, this one, I'm not 100% sure what it is or what the support will be like. It is an ID Tech card from 1991, so a little late. Um, and then there is one more in here um, that I would have to find, but they aren't uh, like super big name brands. National Instruments, Agilent, HP, those are the ones that are the most popular and have the best driver support. So getting a National Instruments uh, GPIB card like this is really handy for this project. So. That's going to be something that I'm going to try and do with this. So that's why there is plenty more to talk about after this test. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. But that's, again, a bit of a ways off. And, well, I got stuff to move in and plenty of things that I need to be worrying about still. So that's not going to be happening immediately. But I am very excited about it. Oh, man. But, yeah, it's, it's incredible having so much space. Uh, I still... I'm turn on a light here. I still can't believe that I'm in here doing this. This is this is amazing. So I'm I'm very grateful to have this opportunity and appreciate all of the support everyone has given me that makes this possible. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty much done here. I'm going to give you one little tidbit. Um, up here, you'll see a string attached to the ceiling, and if I try and position the phone just right, you'll see. Hopefully, that goes to the corner of the PC game shelf there. Now, I had the idea to put this up while I was filming the XP video, because that gives me the angle to be dead on with the shelves every single time. So I was just positioning the camera's tripod here underneath of the string, which you really can't see from that far down, but it's there. So I would try and position a tripod underneath that string to try and maintain the same orientation. And it worked fairly well, actually. I'm quite happy with that. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for now. <laughs> um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you want to support the channel, again, uh, you can buy a really cool shirt. Ah, ah, look at that. That's a keyboard. I like that one. Um, and you can become a patron. Uh, there's plenty of ways. There's a lot of links in the description on how you can do that. But that is it for now. Uh, in the subsequent office vlogs, we're going to be mostly focusing on moving more stuff in. Um, this was just a pretty exciting one where I got to show off some of the plans that I have, but I really need to get like that whole space cleared and then actually get to my electronics bench stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of steps that need to be gone through for this still, but uh, making a lot of progress. So I'll see you guys later.